Murder and Such contains true stories about murders, the macabre, true crime, serial killers, and other dark subject matter. This includes adult themes, explicit language, descriptions of gore, violence, and other information provided by news articles, witness testimony, and public record. Murder and Such is not intended for all audiences, and although warnings will be set in place, listener discretion is still advised. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Murder and Such. I am your host, Hunter. I thank you for standing by while I was working on a couple of new episodes, and sorry that it's been almost a month since the last one had come out. So, as you can imagine, I have some housekeeping to take care of. So, please join me in thanking my lovely Texas whiskey savior, Audrey Morgan, for jumping on the Patreon page. And I'd also love to give a thank you to a longtime friend for the past... Hell, this has got to be going on like 15 years now. My friend, Kristen Abbas. Kristen has always supported the show, and even supported me to do a better job of myself. In a very funny way, I might add. But thank you, Kristen. The next people I'd like to thank have all joined the executive producer level on Patreon, which... Seriously, that's absolutely incredible, and you'll all be thanked at the end of each and every episode as well. So a heartfelt thanks to Bex, who not only joined the Patreon, but also sent an incredible message to me on Instagram. So thank you, Bex. And I also want to thank a longtime listener named Shy Froond for also pulling the trigger and jumping on the Patreon. A massive thank you to Fatina Louvier, which I'm pretty sure I nailed the pronunciation of your name. But a big thank you to Fatina for also joining the Patreon. And last, but most certainly not least, is my longtime friend named Mindy Baker for also joining the Patreon page. Mindy has honestly been one of the longest friends that I can remember, but she also had sent in a little care package for Vincent in which that boy went apeshit. So thank you very, very much, Mindy. But thank you to each and every single one of you for joining the Patreon page. It truly warms my heart that you're so generous with your support, and I couldn't do it without each and every single one of you. And if you'd like to join Shy, Mindy, Audrey, Kristen, Fatina, and Bex, you can join the Patreon at patreon.com backslash murder and such, and you can join for as little as $1 per episode, get the show early, ad-free, a permanent discount, for merchandise and help pay for treats for my cat's gigantic ass. And that reminds me, if you want to grab merch, you'll find the affiliate link in the show notes for this very episode, as well as the link to Patreon. But if you can't donate, no problem. I thank you for being here. And if you do have the capabilities, drop a five star review on Apple Podcasts. That also helps me, and it costs literally nothing. And if you don't have an iPhone, just steal your coworkers and drop a five star. Thank you. Now, since I got the housekeeping out of the way, the floors are swept, and I've got your attention, let's start jumping into this case. If you're a longtime listener of Murder and Such, you will know that I myself am an LGBTQIA ally. Personally, I am what you would consider a straight, white, cis male. I have won the proverbial genetic lottery, and I've never really faced hatred by someone of a different sexual preference than my own. I've never been the target because of my race, gender, or sexual preference. But again, it's a lottery that I kind of lucked out on since birth. Hate crimes aren't something that I probably will ever experience, which really shines a light on those who have faced hate or even death over something that they have absolutely no control over. Like Brandon Tina, a trans man who was beaten, raped, then murdered by John Lauder 
and Tom Neeson as an accomplice after they found out that Tina was born with female genitalia. There was also a movie that Hilary Swank played the role of Brandon Tina in the movie Boys Don't Cry. Or with Matthew Shepard, who was a gay man in Laramie, Wyoming, who was tortured, beaten, tied to a fence, and found 18 hours later, but succumbed to his injuries and had passed away. His attackers were Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney, who are both serving life sentences, which, good. I hope that those pricks stub their toes every single day for the rest of their goddamn lives. But those are two of the most infamous cases in the United States. But when researching this particular case, there is a monumental list of people who have been beaten and murdered simply because they were gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer. A reason that isn't justified for any fucking reason at all. Even in the last episode that I did with Adrian Loya, the victims were a gay couple. And I just don't understand it. But as I'm going to pull out that card, I've got gay friends. I even have a gay sibling. And if you have hatred in your heart for people who have a different sexual preference than what society deems acceptable, or if your religious preference says that it's bad and these people are sinners, then uh, just do me a favor and not listen to my show. Because I don't have time for people like that in my life. So thank you. But anyways, this case is relevant to the community because it surrounds the deaths of four gay men. But unlike the few cases that I've already mentioned, the perpetrator wouldn't be someone that you would normally think. But as always, my name is Hunter, and you're listening to Murder and Such. And this is episode 80. The Last Call Killer. July 10th of 1992. A gruesome discovery was made off of the turnpike off of Route 72 in Burlington County, New Jersey. Sanitation workers were picking up trash and found that there were several green garbage bags that were dumped along the area. When trying to retrieve the bags for disposal, one of the bags had torn slightly and started filling the air with the smell of decomposition. When sanitation workers pulled the bag open to see what was inside, they weren't greeted with maybe a dead animal, which honestly would have been a better outcome, but I wouldn't be covering this if it wasn't worth noting. When they opened the bag up, they found the decomposing head of a 57-year-old man by the name of Thomas Mulcahy. Thomas was a married man, a father of four, and a computer equipment sales executive who owned his own business based out of Sudbury, Massachusetts. Immediately, the sanitation workers had called the authorities since they had uncovered an actual crime scene. Within minutes, the police responded to the severed head and found that the nature in which the head was severed was with some sort of a coarse-toothed saw. They closed off the scene, but soon found more of what had remained of Thomas Mulcahy. In completely separate bags, they found the upper part of Thomas's torso. In another bag, they had found his left arm. In another bag, they found his right arm. And in another bag, all by itself, they had found Thomas's intestines. They scoured the scene and looked for any more evidence or a reason of why this man would have been murdered, but they didn't find his lower torso or either of his legs. When going through the evidence at the one scene, they get a call of a discovery over near the Stanford Forge area, roughly 20 miles from where they currently were, of human remains that were dumped haphazardly in a trash bin. The police responded within half an hour while leaving the other remains with forensic investigators to gather what evidence they could find. When the authorities arrived on scene, they found the rest of what remained of Thomas Mulcahy. They found the lower torso of Thomas that was double-knotted in the same trash bags as the upper half of his body, 
then found a severed left leg in a bag and a severed right leg in a bag, but they also found a bed sheet, a shower curtain, eight rubber gloves, the bag for those gloves, and a saw with a detachable handle. They also found a pair of slacks that Thomas presumably was wearing, and inside of those, they found his driver's license, some business cards, and any money that he would have had on there has been removed. It's not too often that, with such a gruesome murder, that they immediately get an identification of a body. As most killers will try to do their best to obfuscate any investigations that may give away any sort of early answers as to who or why somebody would do this, but this was not your typical murder case. The body was then transported to the state medical examiner's office in Newark, New Jersey, and they made an interesting discovery. The hacksaw itself was not used to cut through bone at all, but rather separate his limbs from his torso, sever his torso in half, and left little to no markings on the bones. The hacksaw was only used to dismember the limbs from the body. The state examiner also found that the hacksaw was not the murder weapon, but that Thomas had been stabbed to death. Then, after some hours, he was dismembered, placed inside of the double bags, the bags then double knotted, and spread across New Jersey. But as far as a motive for killing Thomas, leaving behind his wife of 33 years, four children, and his business? Investigators had nothing. The other thing that took them by surprise was when they were looking at all of the evidence, they found that the arms, leg, torso, head, plus the trash bags, and the hacksaw were all washed with medical soap before being discarded. With the knowledge of limb separation and the medical soap they found traces of, they knew that they were dealing with someone who was working with surgical precision. The authorities then went and informed Thomas's wife and kids about their husband and father's murder. When they asked why he would be up in New Jersey, she had stated that he was on a business trip up there for some potential new clients and partnerships with his business. It was reported that Thomas was one hell of a salesman for his company, which gave he and his family a very comfortable living situation. But when they asked his wife if he had any enemies at all or knew of anybody who would do something like this to him, she stated that he was a friendly man and was better at making friends than enemies. With police having almost no information to go off of, they started tracing his credit card activity so that maybe they could pinpoint where he was at prior to his murder. And one place that sparked curiosity was the last activity on his card that was at the Townhouse Piano Bar of New York, located on East 58th Street. And as of today, the Townhouse Piano Bar has since shuttered their doors since the COVID-19 pandemic has struck New York harder than most places. They currently have an email list for when or if they reopen, but from pictures, it is an absolutely gorgeous place. It's very much an upper scale fancy dining bar where three bars lay under one roof and they have nightly piano entertainment. The other thing of note is that the Townhouse Piano Bar is a gay bar up on the east side of New York. As I said previously, it's an upscale bar where usually doctors, businessmen, and other affluent members of the gay community can enjoy food and drinks with live entertainment. After Thomas had swiped his card at the bar, there was only one more place that registered an ATM transaction, and then he mysteriously had disappeared. When the investigators asked his wife about why Thomas would be at a gay bar, she had stated that their marriage, it was a little bit rocky, and she had suspicions that Thomas was bisexual, and had at one time found a pack of matches in his pants pocket for another gay bar that was in New Jersey. You have to imagine that back in the late 80s and early 90s, it wasn't as easy to come out as it is today. And I am not saying that it's easy to come out today either, so please don't think that I'm acting like it's something simple. But with Thomas being a business owner, a father of four, 
It was kind of a secret that he kept between he, his wife, and his partners. But it still did not answer the question of why Thomas would be murdered in such a horrific fashion. At this time, the investigators had nothing to go off of, and with Thomas's family, they wouldn't get any answers until much, much later. And one thing that I want to do is I want to go back to when I mentioned that Bex, my new patron, had sent me a message. She thanked me for putting in the resources for domestic violence helplines and mental health places, because... Those are something that I've dealt with in my life, and I think that the resources themselves can save another life. But one that I will never probably have to call is something for the LGBT community. So for this one, I'm actually going to mention a couple of places. The LGBT National Hotline is available Monday through Friday from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific Time and available Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific Time. You can reach that number at 1-800-843-4564 and you can also find them at lgbthotline.org. And another fantastic place is The Trevor Project. And the Trevor Project is leading the national organization providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention services to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people under the age of 25. They do offer text, instant messaging, and a website, which is thetrevorproject.org, or you can call their hotline at 1-866-488-7386. And like I said, it's not easy for somebody to come out these days. With the political climate that we are trying to work our way out of, it's been treacherous for people who may be gay or bisexual, and definitely for those who are transgender. These two resources can help save someone's life, and if you may not be somebody who is questioning or have come to terms with their sexuality, please pass this information on to somebody who might need them. I, you know, I always, I always tell you guys that I love you guys, and I really do. So I'm going to take a small break, pay some bills, give Vincent some treats, and I'll be right back. And also, before you skip forward, I want to thank everyone who's purchased some device skins from extremeskins.co.uk that I've had sponsor some episodes. They're once again a sponsor, so thank you again, and remember to use the code MURDER15 at checkout to save 15% off your entire order. So I'm going to play that ad, and I'll be right back. Hey guys, it's Hunter for Murder and Such. This episode was made possible by my friends over at Extreme Skins. Do you ever get tired of the way that your phone or laptop looks and you want something just a bit different to make it stand out from the rest of the crowd? Well, listeners of this show have a special offer. I'm one of the lucky people who got themselves a PlayStation 5, and to be honest, I didn't much care for the bright white on the jet black look, which is why I'm absolutely stoked that Extreme Skins decided to sponsor this episode. Extreme Skins has been featured on The Guardian, Windows Central, and 9to5Google for their high-quality vinyl designs and easy-to-apply process. Plus, if you want to take the skins off your device, the adhesive leaves no residue on the surface. For phones, they cover everything from phones like the Apple iPhone, the Samsung Galaxy series, OnePlus phones, Google phones, to laptops like MacBooks, Asus, Dell, and Microsoft. They also do iPad skins, console skins, AirPods, and they even have their own line of sleek, minimalist phone cases called the X30. Not only that, but they sent me a skin for my PlayStation 5, which has an aged oak on both sides with brushed titanium down the middle, which to me looks a hell of a lot better than the original color scheme. But you can see pictures of that on the Instagram and Facebook pages. 
and they also have a full list of install videos to help with any issues at all, and customer service is quick and painless. But listeners of this show can get 15% off their order by going to Extreme Skins, that's X-T-R-E-M-E, skins.co.uk, and use code MURDER15 at checkout to save 15% off their entire order. That's X-T-R-E-M-E-S-K-I-N-S dot C-O dot U-K and use code M-U-R-D-E-R 15, no spaces, to save 15% off your order. But thank you again to Extreme Skins for working with me and helping make my devices look absolutely amazing. Now back to the show. Okay, Vincent's got his treats, and thank you for sticking with me. Welcome back. Let's get back into this. One piece of evidence that they had was not only the blood-soaked gloves that the killer had used, but also the packaging in which the gloves were in. Now, back in the early 90s, we maybe didn't use UPC codes as much, and there was a sticker on the bag which gave investigators a clue as to where they were purchased at. The price sticker showed that the gloves were purchased at a CVS drugstore in Staten Island, the southernmost borough of New York City, and not far from New Jersey at all. When they went to the store, they also found that the trash bags that Thomas was found inside of were also available for purchase in the store as well. Now, they had asked the clerk if they noticed anyone buying both of these items at the same time, and they really couldn't remember, and then again... This is also the early 90s, and trying to find video evidence of someone who might just happen to come into the store and purchase the gloves and trash bags yielded no results at all. It's worth noting that Staten Island is also home to half a million people, so the investigators were left with nothing to go off of, and unfortunately, the case went cold. In the meantime... Thomas is laid to rest on July 16th with a funeral procession at Our Lady Fatima Church in Sudbury. Then his body was laid to rest at the New North Cemetery, also in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Instead of sending flowers, the family had asked that donations would be made out to the Carol Diamati Stewart Foundation, which was founded in the memory of the murder of Carol Diamati in Boston, Massachusetts in October of 1989, which the foundation was established by her brother. Later, they had found that her husband, Charles, had been the murderer after saying that it was, quote, a black guy with a raspy voice and had wounded himself with a gun. But after his story fell apart, the police found that Charles himself had done it and leapt to his death off of the Tobin Bridge in Boston. Carol had also just given birth prematurely to her son Christopher, and he passed 17 days later. Thomas Mulcahy was laid to rest, surrounded by his family, friends, various business associates, and a community that wanted answers. Now, it'd be 10 months later that this formerly cold case would be reopened and more information would reignite this case and lead investigators on another hunt. May 10th, 1993, Manchester Township, New Jersey. A man at a park notices a smell that hits his nostrils in a very specific way. It's a putrid smell with a sweet tinge to it. When he looks closer at the trash bin, he discovers a human leg and calls the authorities. Police arrive on scene and are greeted with the smell of decomposition. So they close off the scene and they get investigators on to figure out what had just happened. Considering it wasn't even a year after Thomas Mulcahy was found, the investigators noticed something that threw them through a loop. In one double bag, they had found a leg. But when searching the area, they found six more bags. 
One contained the other leg, another contained an arm, another had contained a lower half of a torso, one had the upper half of the torso, one had the other arm, and one had a head. No cuts through the bone, dismembered post-mortem, the body and bags washed with medical soap, and little to no other evidence to go off of. Investigators haven't given any information about how Thomas had been murdered, so the likelihood of this being a copycat killer was practically diminished. But they did find something of note. A plastic bag from a place called President's Choice, which was a brand that wasn't widely available, but tracked down to 11 separate locations. One just so happened to be in Staten Island. More notably, not very far from the CVS where they located the source of the bags and gloves from the Thomas Mulcahy murder. But there was one other thing that was different. The victim wasn't left with any sort of identification. When the body came in to the medical examiner's office, they found that the victim had been stabbed to death, much like Thomas, and was also dismembered in the same way with seven parts, seven double bags that were double knotted. The body and bags had been washed with medical soap, but the question of who this person was found another similarity to Thomas. Examiners took fingerprints of the body, which led to an exact match of a man who had some prior run-ins with the law. They eventually identified the body as being that of 43-year-old man by the name of Anthony Edward Marrero, otherwise known as Fast Eddie. Anthony lived on the streets of Manhattan and often got by on his day-to-day -day working as a male prostitute. The charges that he faced were for prostitution out of the Port Authority Terminal in New York. He often worked alone and had very little associates. His nickname was given to him usually because he was quick with his clients, often earning somewhere between $10 to $50 at a time. When it came to Anthony, he had a very turbulent life in his short 43 years. He was formerly married, but a lot of that fell apart due to Anthony's deteriorating mental health, punctuated by years of hard drug usage. He was born in Puerto Rico and raised in the Philadelphia area. He had a dream to become a pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team, and he even had a tryout for the league itself, but unfortunately he was not asked back. Followed by some very long periods of absences from family members, friends, and other associates, his last known job was working as a custodian in 1990. After that hadn't panned out, he turned to sex work at the Poor Authority Terminal in New York to try and support his growing drug habit. Again, if you've listened to the show, you will also know that my stance on sex work is that it should be legalized and safe so that people don't randomly go missing or get abused by someone who's looking for sex. Sex work is real work, and it should be regulated instead of criminalized. But for Anthony, he had met up with the same person who Thomas had met, and also faced the same grim fate as he did. Except this time... There was something that the killer had not planned on, and no matter how much premeditation they did, they left behind a piece of evidence that wasn't conclusive at the offset, but would later come back to haunt them. That being two partial fingerprints and a palm print. Now, Anthony never got the chance to get clean, get the treatment that he needed, and become a pitcher on the Phillies or live out the rest of his natural life. There was someone out there that thought that Fast Eddie didn't deserve to live anymore and cut his life short for, again, no reason at all. So now, we have this double murder done in the exact same way, using the same exact methods, and targeting the same sexuality between the victims. Was this someone who was a thrill killer? 
somebody who just wanted to murder someone because of their sexual orientation. As I mentioned earlier, back in the early 90s, it wasn't widely accepted for somebody to come out as gay or bisexual, but to murder somebody for that? It left investigators just as stunned as you and I are. But that piece of evidence, the partial palm print and two fingerprints. The investigators managed to carbon print the fingerprints and were able to lift the identifying marks off of the bags themselves and started working with New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and their own New Jersey crime lab to try and get a positive match for the prints, but all of them had come back with no matches at all. They even sent them off to every state in the U.S. to try to get a match, but as this takes time, about two months after they sent out the prints, they get a phone call from two hours north of New Jersey that wasn't the news that they were hoping for. A hot dog vendor about 12 miles north of New York set up his stand near the water in Haverstraw, New York. And when he went to use a trash can, he noticed the smell that had been emanating from the can, much like it did with the bodies of Thomas Mulcahy and Anthony Marrero. He found a bag that was tied up and looked like it had some dried blood on the outside. Of course, his curiosity got the best of him, and he untied the double-knotted bag and found two severed arms folded up inside. The authorities came, interviewed the vendor, then started to uncover the rest of what was scattered amongst the trash bags. In all, they recovered seven pieces. Two severed arms, two severed legs, a torso in two separate pieces, and lastly, a severed head. When it comes to a lot of killers who claim multiple victims that aren't in a spree-style killing, there's something known as a cool-down period. If you're unfamiliar with that term, the cool-down period, or cool-off period, usually occurs after a killer's first murder, but there is some debate about it. But for some sick and twisted shit who wonders what it's like to kill someone, they will take the first life and then have a period of time where they will be overwhelmed by the act of them killing someone and will go back to what they would consider their normal life for a while until they're once again overwhelmed with the thought of that adrenaline hit, the power that they desire, and finally go out and do it again just to satiate their disgusting bloodthirst and take another life. With this person, the first was Thomas Mulcahy, then 10 months of cooling down before taking the life of Anthony Marrero. Now, not even two months later, they find the remains of a third man, a 56-year-old man by the name of Michael Sakara. Now, I mentioned the cool-down period because to the investigators, they think that this is the case, but one other person will pop up just a little bit later. But no matter what, whoever this killer is has just become a serial killer, and they are starting a bloody rampage all across the Northeast Coast. The third victim, Michael Sakara, had a partner of nine years and spent most nights the exact same way. When he got off of work, he would head down to the Five Oaks Bar and Restaurant on Grove Street. Michael was a big teddy bear. He was an amateur singer, a baritone. He stood a towering six foot four inches tall and weighed roughly 250 pounds. Coworkers at the New York Law Journal, where Michael worked, said that Michael was very bright and intense in a good way. He also knew how to play the piano. He was a lovable man with a firm handshake and would talk to practically anyone who came into contact with him. The last night that he was seen was on July 29th of 1993 at the Four Oaks Bar, where he would often go and have a drink. Whether it was to be a socialite or just have a drink and unwind, he was not one to be shy about conversation. That night, he sat two seats from the bar's wall and spoke with the bartender most of the night. 
It was a Thursday evening, and you can imagine that there were probably a few patrons at the bar, but the bartender had said that the seats had been mostly empty. Roughly four hours before close, towards the end of her shift, a man came and sat next to Michael. He wasn't a face that was too familiar to her. He didn't frequent the bar. A man standing roughly about six foot tall with glasses and shaggy brown hair. He was clean shaven and had introduced himself as John to Michael. Not one to shy away from a friendly conversation, Michael and John talked over drinks, mainly about what they did for a living since they were both sitting at yet another upscale gay bar. But it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for two men to just sit and have conversation. John had stated that he was a nurse at the St. Vincent Catholic Medical Center in Greenwich Village. Michael introduced John to the bartender, and they continued to drink, talk, laugh, and have what would look like a normal conversation. Another patron by the name of Charles Cadenese, who arrived at 2 a.m., saw Michael talking to his newfound friend and thought nothing of it when he left at around 4 o'clock in the morning. Charles would be the last friend of Michael's to see him alive. Michael left that bar that night with John and wouldn't be found until about two days later by an unsuspecting hot dog vendor. Now this is where things start becoming more public. The murders of Thomas and Anthony were somewhat unknown as police and stepped in and secured the scene before any details could come out to the media. But with the discovery of Michael, there's an interview with a vendor where he's describing what he had found. There was no keeping this case from the public eye any longer. Immediately, police start scrambling to keep the vendor's information to a minimum, but they had already disclosed that the severed arms that they had found, and when the police were gathering the evidence, there were a ton of onlookers. The media picked up the story and then started doing their own investigations. They had found out about the murder of Thomas Mulcahy and the fact that he was at the townhouse bar that night when he had disappeared. They soon also learned about Anthony Marrero's murder and knew that he had been a sex worker out of the Port Authority. With the discovery of Michael, people who had known him were talking to each other about who could have done this, and it was leaked to the media that he was also a gay male, and since the press likes to make headlines, they struck a ton of fear into the gay and lesbian communities of New York. People stopped going to bars, or even if they did, they would go with a group of friends and try to keep to themselves. The bartender at the Five Oaks had stated that the man's name was John, and he worked as a nurse at the St. Vincent's Hospital. They asked the bartender to come in and try to give a composite sketch of the man that she saw Michael with, and she went along willingly. The sketch that they came up with was a very nondescript white male with shaggy brown hair. With his admission that he worked at the hospital, it gave investigators something more to work off of. But... Yet another thing came up in the meantime. Thanks to the media, with the New York and New Jersey detectives working diligently on the case, but with the news that was coming out of the areas of now three dead bodies being found, the state troopers in Pennsylvania reached out to the investigators with the discovery that they had thought was an isolated incident. On May 5th of 1991, a trash collector looking for aluminum cans in various trash bins had also made a horrific discovery. Inside of a green steel drum, he found the body of a man who had been stabbed to death, stripped naked, mutilated almost beyond recognition, and contorted into several large trash bags and disposed of in that very drum. The body inside was that of 45-year-old Peter S. Anderson of Philadelphia. He worked primarily as an investment banker, but he also had a secondary life as an affluent socialite, usually visiting New York for business and pleasure. In 1991, he and his second wife had become separated, and he was usually away from his homestead and out drinking. It was said that he was depressed as his marriage was falling apart, 
and people had speculated that the marriage was ending due to their presumptions that Peter was either gay or bisexual. Peter was also a very small man measuring only 5 foot 2 inches tall, and it was said at the time of his death, he was facing liver issues which they attributed that to his significant weight loss because of his alcohol consumption. At the time of his death, Peter only weighed roughly 100 pounds. But shortly before his murder, he was seen at the townhouse piano bar, the same place where Thomas Mulcahy had last been seen out. But the issue with this murder wasn't that he had been murdered in the same way that Thomas, Anthony, or Michael had been. He had not been dismembered as they were, but the amount of stab wounds to the chest, the heinous mutilation that Peter had experienced was not only sadistic, but there was definitely some sort of a passion behind it. When they exhumed his body, they had found that there were over 200 slash marks on his arms, leg, chest, torso, face, and back. Pieces of skin were cut away from his body and thrown into the bags. One of his eyes had been gouged out and the other one was stabbed. His lower lip had been removed and both ears were cut off. But they also found that Peter's penis had been cut off of his body and his testicles were missing. But when they opened his mouth, they found his genitalia inside. Much like the other three murders, with a motive they had nothing to go off of. The body had been scrubbed clean, and the bags were also washed with medical soap, a telltale sign of this serial killer. But this was over a year before Thomas's remains would be found. So was this another year-long cool-down from Peter to Thomas, then from Thomas to Anthony, then from Anthony to Michael only a couple months later? I'm going to bring this up again. The Pennsylvania State Troopers were talking to detectives in New York and New Jersey, and they start disclosing information amongst themselves. They are working together. Whoever this person is, whoever is targeting gay men for their violence needs to be stopped and needs to be stopped right now. With the information that John worked as a nurse in St. Vincent's Hospital in Greenwich Village, investigators took with their composite sketch and started asking directors of nursing about someone who might match this description. They found a male nurse with shaggier brown hair brown eyes, and average height by the name of Mark Slayton, who's a 38-year-old man who lived in Staten Island near the places where they found the bags and gloves, and they found that he didn't have much of a social life. They bring him in for questioning. The authorities think that maybe this is the guy. Maybe they finally found this serial killer who's targeting gay and bisexual men for the past two years, and they finally got them in their grasp. But during questioning, he answers everything truthfully. Sure, he lives in the area that they were scoping out in Staten Island. He also works in medical field, so he would have access to information on bodies and surgical procedures, and even has access to medical soap, which was used to mask all but two fingerprints and the palm print. But for his whereabouts, he had alibis for every night which there was a murder. Not only that, but they ask him if he would be willing to give his fingerprints over for examination, and he gives them willingly. Now, it does take time for fingerprints to come back to the investigators, so they keep an eye on Mark, making sure about his whereabouts at all times, checking with his alibis, and make sure that everything checks out. Then they're hit with the worst news they could imagine. The prints don't match at all. Mark Slayton was not the man they were looking for. Everything had checked out for him, and while they thought it could finally bring some closure to the murders of Thomas, Michael, Peter, and Anthony's families, they were sent back out to go find the right person, and Mark was free to go. I'm going to take a quick break, and I will be right back. Hang tight.
Hey, I'm Sammy. Ready Ready for for something something frightful? Come join me and guest narrators as we read real stories from the paranormal. Suddenly their bedroom door handle started being violently janked up and down like someone was having a go at it and then everything just stopped. To creepy encounters with people who have nefarious intentions. And it was the same two people. It turns out those two had connections to a human trafficking ring. Subscribe to the It's Frightful podcast and Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Until next time, it's not like we needed to sleep tonight anyways. Thanks for sticking with me. Welcome back, and let's go on to The Last Call Killer. That's right, The Last Call Killer. That was the name that the zero killer was given by the media due to the fact that all these men were found mere hours or days after they had last been seen alive while at a bar. The person stocked upscale gay bars. Obviously, they had to be someone with money, with a job, or at least a means of making said money. They had to know the bars, scope them out, and look for someone who they wouldn't suspect that they'd soon meet their end. Someone charismatic who could spark up a conversation and keep it going long into the night where they could finally get their victims into their grasp. The areas around the bars are being watched by both police and scared citizens. Patronage starts to fluctuate as bargoers are afraid that they could be the next victim. But just as this killer started getting media attention, everything stops. There weren't any more bodies found, at least not in the same way that the last call killer had left them. Everything goes quiet. Did this killer just leave the New York area, or did they relocate to a different state and continue their rampage there? Was this maybe another cooldown period and they went back into hiding? For investigators, all tips that were sent in had led nowhere with no convictions or credible evidence. The news coverage also subsides. People were very outspoken with the fear behind the murderers, but also some were more outspoken that they were almost happy that the members of the gay community were meeting a grim fate, which fuck those people. But the communities and families wanted answers, and most of all, they wanted the person who could have done this. But for now, and from what it seemed forever, the cases involving these four innocent men end up going cold. It wouldn't be until March of 2000, with the help of technological advances, that the cases were eventually reopened and investigators were finally given some more answers. Now you have to imagine, throughout the course of time, technological advances have increased at an exponential rate. DNA testing, hair sample testing, even fingerprint identification. By this time, there was a nationwide database that was being established with the help of the internet. It would be kind of a long and tedious process to examine fingerprints digitally, and it was even harder considering the fact that they only had two fingerprints and the partial palm print that was found on the bags that Anthony Marrera was found inside of. Hardly enough to get a full idea of who could have done this. But, and this information is coming from the episode of Forensic Files called Touch of Evil, which was Season 15, Episode 8, that aired on December 17th of 2010, the investigators found out about a new technique called vacuum metal deposition that was being used up at a crime lab in Toronto, Canada. Now, thankfully, the investigators kept all of the bags and other pieces of evidence from the findings locked away for nearly 10 years, and they sent it up to Toronto to see if there was any more information they could get from these bags. From what Forensic Files tells us, the investigators take about 10 milligrams of gold, which is locked into a chamber with the evidence, then the gold itself is heated to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which vaporizes the gold and it clings to the oils that the fingerprints have. 
From there, they heat up the metal zinc, which adheres to the gold when it's also vaporized, and when it comes in contact with the gold, it turns black, which brings the fingerprints to the surface. From there, each piece of evidence is examined and scoured for any remaining fingerprints that may be on the evidence that they didn't get upon first inspection. Science and technology is fucking incredible. So what the investigators found wasn't just the three fingerprints on the bags that Anthony Marrero was found in, but they also found 16 additional fingerprints on the bags that Thomas Mulcahy was found. And all of a sudden, these two partial fingerprints and palm print gave them much more to work off of. And when you compile that with a national database that was starting to form, the chances of you finding the person that these belong to increases exponentially. Sadly, they didn't find any additional prints on any of the evidence found with Michael Sakara or Peter Anderson, but due to the nature of the murders, they were almost 99% sure that the same killer carried out all four murders. Yet they hit another roadblock. Unfortunately, when they entered the prints into the database, they got nothing. But another investigator had decided to send the hard copies to each of the 50 states just in case they didn't have their files fully uploaded to the national records. Luckily for them, they finally got a match. When the state examiner in Maine had received the hard copy of the fingerprints, they entered them into their own database and found a match. Of course, a digital match needs to also be verified by the naked eye, as automation was still in its infancy. And luckily for the investigators, on May 14th of 2001, they were told by state examiner Kim Stevens, a fingerprint analyzer, that it was an exact match. When investigators asked why they had this person's fingerprints on file, they said it was because they had to fingerprint someone almost 30 years prior on yet another possible murder charge. The fingerprints themselves have been identified as belonging to a man by the name of Richard W. Rogers Jr., born on June 16th of 1950 in Plymouth, Massachusetts. When they had their man, they managed to grab a picture and ask the bartender if she had recognized him. She replied that he was the man that she saw Michael Sakara with the night that he disappeared. They started to reach out to other people who had given witness statements about the last times they saw Anthony Marrero and Thomas Mulcahy and asked a few of them to try to come in and point out someone in a lineup. But let's talk about this possible murder. When Richard was attending college at the University of Maine going for a degree, he had a roommate by the name of Frederick Spencer. He and Frederick were really good friends, and Richard was typically quiet, kept to himself, and didn't act out of line. He was noted as being a very neat student, very timely, with nothing really outstanding with him. But there was always a sneaking suspicion amongst classmates that there might have been a sexual relation between the two of them. And I can't confirm, but it's just speculation. Now, the way that it was explained was that Richard said he acted in self-defense and bludgeoned his roommate to death with a hammer, then bound up his body inside of a tarp and dumped it on the side of the road, stating that he didn't know what to do with the body. So he was arraigned on a murder charge, but this is also back in 1973, and this is one man's word against a dead man's body. He had stated that Frederick tried to persuade Richard into having sex with him, and Richard said no. He then said that Frederick picked up a hammer and charged at him, which Richard allegedly managed to get the hammer away from him, then bludgeoned him to death. He also managed to convince a jury that he acted in self-defense, and he was later acquitted of these charges. This kind of brings me back to the cooldown period. His first murder was in 1973. It wouldn't be until 18 years later that he claims the life of Peter Anderson, mutilates him, and leaves his body in a trash bin. I personally believe that this was the first cooldown period. Regardless, this is why they have Richard Rogers' fingerprints on file. 
but I'm just happy that they still had him, even though it was 30 years later. When it comes to life post-acquittal, Richard obtained a nursing degree and started working at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. He started working there in 1979, working primarily as a bedside nurse, but later became a surgical nursing assistant, someone all too familiar with precision incisions and how our bodies articulate. Yet, in the 1980s, Richard had finally come out and embraced his sexuality. He was a gay man, which really contradicts his story that he told the jury when it came to the death of Frederick Spencer. But again, you can't try someone for the same crime after they've been acquitted, otherwise known as double jeopardy. Think O.J. Simpson. Yet, even though he got away with that, he did have another brush in with the law on August 10th of 1988. On that evening, after an unnamed man came to the Staten Island Police Department to file a report, the police had arrested Richard on the pretense that the unnamed man had said that Richard had drugged him with an unknown substance, then binded his arms and legs with rope and proceeded to rape and beat the victim. When Richard was arrested, he said that he was not drugged, but the man had been drinking a lot, and he said that it wasn't a beating and rape, that the beating was part of their play, and that the sex was actually consensual. But this guy, he also stated, was a scorned lover. They tested the man for any sort of date rape drugs, which came back inconclusive. The police had nothing to go off of, and they had to drop the charges. If only there was some way that they could have stuck. Another thing that pointed to Richard was where he lived. 82 Bridge Court, Staten Island, New York. Only 1.1 miles away from the CVS pharmacy that they found the gloves were purchased at, and only 2 miles away from the other store where the President's Choice bags were found. It would seem that Richard was all too comfortable, and his entire world was about to come crashing down. May 28th of 2001, a 14-person team heads to Mount Sinai Hospital and arrests the 51-year-old man. The pending charges were murder in the first degree. Although he is suspected of four, they only have the fingerprints tying him to the murders of Anthony Marrero and Thomas Mulcahy. If they could have found his fingerprints on the scenes of Michael and Peters' murders, you know damn well they would have tried him with those two. After that, they're able to obtain a search warrant of his house. Now, his house was described as exceedingly clean. Almost too clean. Everything had a place. Everything was neat. The things that weren't so neat were the Polaroid photographs that he had stuffed away that showed various men with what looked like stab wounds drawn onto the pictures. And the other thing they found was a bottle of Versed. Now, Versed, otherwise known as Midazolam, is a sedative that's used to help cause drowsiness, decrease anxiety, and decrease your memory of a surgery or procedure. It's also been known to be used as a date rape drug. It is also not scanned for in rape test kits or autopsies. Now, why would a surgical nurse have something like that in his possession? After he was arrested and brought in, he had his first bond hearing. They set his bond at $1 million cash, and of course, since he didn't have that money, he was taken to Rikers Island to await trial. In the meantime, the investigators brought in and known associates and clients from the local gay bars and restaurants. They put Richard in a lineup with other men, and every single person who was asked to identify they saw either Michael, Anthony, or Thomas with had all pointed at Richard Rogers. He was also a frequent patron at the Townhouse Piano Bar. In an article from the New York Times that was posted in 2001, a quote from a man by the name of Patrick Henry III had said, quote, Richie would never kill anyone, God no. He is a lovely fellow who likes antiques and everything that has to do with money. He was the kind of guy you could trust with your ATM card. End quote. 
a lot of his close friends and associates were shocked that this could have been the man. Patrick Henry knew him for 12 years. Nobody could have suspected that Richard Rogers was the last call killer. But with Richard behind bars, it was now time to piece the times, dates, whereabouts, and all of this circumstantial evidence together in a nice, neat little package and lock this fucker away for the rest of his life. The police and prosecutor E. David Millard had their work cut out for them, but thanks to forensic advancements since the early 90s, they'd have a pretty easy task. On October 19th of 2005, the prosecution had actually given Richard a chance to plead guilty to the two murders and possibly be out of prison in 15 years. He didn't take the deal, which honestly on his part would have been stupid, but luckily for the rest of us and the citizens of the United States and practically the world, that was a good thing. During the court case, the prosecution laid out everything pertaining to these two murders. They stated that Thomas Mulcahy was drinking at the townhouse with Richard the night of his murder. And before the bar had closed, Richard had convinced Thomas to come back to his place in Staten Island instead of his hotel room that was mere blocks away from the bar. Thomas obliged and off they went. When they got to the house, Richard didn't want to take any chances at all. So Thomas was injected with Versid, which knocked him out cold. He then transported his body into the bathtub, where he was eventually stabbed to death. I can only hope that he didn't feel anything. After that, Richard then took the handsaw, and while pulling his limbs away and dislocating his sockets for his arms and legs, he methodically dismembered him at the joints rather than through the bones themselves the type of surgical precision that he was used to at the Mount Sinai Hospital. In the meantime, while the trial was ongoing, with the news spreading around that the last call killer was apprehended and now facing a jury, the New York, New Jersey, and surrounding states let out a sigh of relief since it had been years since they last heard of this killer targeting the LGBTQ community. But thanks to those fine-ass Canadians up in Toronto, the main examiner, Kim Stevens, and the law enforcement who refused to give up on the case, they were finally a little bit safer. Now, his trial lasted nearly three weeks. It's a very long trial, but during the entire trial, he was tight-lipped, showed no emotion, did not want to be questioned by the prosecution, and tried to let the evidence speak for itself. However, on the final day of his trial, which was November 11th of 2005, he was a lot different. He started acting nervously, he was bouncing his knees, licking his lips, and started feverishly sweating. The judge had actually asked him if he needed to see medical attention, and he said no, as if nothing was wrong with him. But he was definitely feeling the heat underneath his collar. It only took the jury about four hours to deliberate, and when they came back, they found Richard W. Rogers guilty of two counts of murder in the first degree and two counts of hindering apprehension. It wouldn't be until January 27th of 2006 when he was sentenced for his crimes. For his sentencing, he was given two 30-year sentences up to life in prison for the murders of Thomas Mulcahy and Anthony Marrero. For hindering apprehension, his sentence was five years minimum and 10 years maximum. Richard Rogers will be available for parole on September 18th of 2066, which unfortunately for him, that'll put him at 116 years old. I don't think he's going to make it out. But he is currently listed as inmate 00085597C and is currently in custody with the Department of Corrections with the state of New Jersey. Richard W. Rogers will die behind prison walls, and honestly, that is a good sentence for him. I hope that he stubs his toes every hour 
for the rest of his life behind bars. Because what this man did, this methodical way of dismembering these bodies and just the heinous acts that he did where he could have killed five people had the one person in the 80s not gotten away. But this man is a monster. He struck fear into the LGBTQ community. And for what? What was his bloodthirst? What did taking these people's lives, taking them away from their families, what did that do for him? What was the rhyme or reason? Because he was maybe lonely? Or because the bloodthirst that he had back in 1973 when he killed his roommate was just not enough for him, and he had to kill four more people? Whatever the reason that anybody may come up with, none of it is justified. And the last call killer will die in a New Jersey prison. But that's going to do it for this episode. I thank you for sticking through this one with me. I hate using this term, but if you enjoyed this episode, maybe consider checking out the Patreon. If not, you can always drop a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That truly does help as well. And if you'd like to follow the show, you can find it on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Murder and Such. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, the PlayStation Network, Steam, and Snapchat at Huntor27. Now, I'd love to thank my executive producers for this episode, which are Bex, Fatina Louvier, Mindy Baker, Shy Froond, That Dead Body Show, Caitlin Prophet, Jason W., Michelle Davis, Nikki with Strictly Homicide Podcast, Angel Renee, The Bama Brew Review Podcast, Aaron Albertson, Michelle Pierce, Jax, Martha Pierce, Alex Aguirre, Justin Reebsum, Nikki, McKenna Johnson, Ariel Safir, Tracy Ford, Stacy Jenks, Dan Sheridan, Benjamin Welch, Ashley Collier, Sharkley Daniels, Erica Summers, Ashley Black, and Tech Support, Danielle Longamore, Heather Wright with Nature vs. Narcissism, Sarah Thompson, and last but not least, Big Daddy Thick Dick. So if you'd like to join them and become an executive producer or just donate a dollar per episode, you can find that at patreon.com backslash murder and such. Also, leave a review. That truly helps me. I can't, I, I can't tell you enough how much that helps me. But thank you for joining me on this one. As always, my name is Hunter, reminding you to wash your filthy hands, wear a mask, call somebody that you love today, and I... We'll talk to you soon. Take care.